Welcome back, everyone, to our uh, last session today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you, um, Professor Dr. Bridget Falkenberg, um, who is teaching um, mainly um, theoretical philosophy, um, with the emphasis on the um, philosophy of science and technology at the um, Technische Universität Dortmund. Uh, in the Faculty of Human Science and Theology. And um, today, her talk is, is going to be about on, on the logic of um, nature. Um, if you are already talking about Professor Patum, you can start. So, thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, fine. Yes. So, <laughs> thank you very much for the invitation um, to this conference. And so I will begin my talk on the logic of nature. I'm sorry, I, uh, <clears throat> so the talk has uh, six parts. Um, uh, first, uh, on the question, what is nature? Um, in the second part, I will give a little bit of historical background uh, and explain in the third part, uh, Hegel's concept of nature. The fourth part um, is about the logical structure of nature the fifth part about the relation between nature and the human mind. And finally, I will um, name, at least name the remaining problem that um, we today have with Hegel's philosophy of nature. So, first let me make uh, some preliminary remarks concerning the translations I give you in my slides. Uh, concerning my quotations from the end of logic, logic I follow the Cambridge edition, um, the translation of George D. Giovanni, uh, and he translates begriff with a concept and, and the term aufheben with sublate. Aufheben is, uh, has various meanings uh, in, in, uh, in German to negate and to elevate and uh, to restitute at the same time and has many facets and, and um, Di Giovanni uses the word sublate, which I adopted. Uh, the translation um, uh, from, uh, of quotations from the philosophy of nature from the encyclopedia uh, is a little bit more problematic. I give my own translations, which are based on um, paragraphs from the translation of the uh, 187 Encyclopedia, the Heidelberg Encyclopedia, which are found in the internet. On the other, other hand, there exists uh, the Petri translation, with, which is uh, uh, quite uh, comprehensive, but which contains several errors uh, which are in need of being corrected. And then I use the, pro uh, the fantastic translation um, uh, program DeepL in order to uh, generate um, my own translation and I put this all together. So, let me come to the first part, what is nature? Um, how can we de develop a concept of nature? That's a problem. This question aims at conceptualization of nature in a way that, um, that the natural sciences do not exactly. <clears throat> in, in the philosophical tradition, uh, there uh, is a double, uh, the, the term nature has a double meaning. On the one hand, na the nature of a thing is the essence uh, of a thing, and um, the essence of a thing is uh, what is subject to Hegel's logic, uh, which is a combination or union, uh, unification of logic and metaphysics. On the other hand, uh, concerning the physical world, um, uh, nature are the things the, uh, that around us, uh, which are subject to a philosophy of nature and uh, of uh, natural science. So the problem with philosophy of nature is how does it relate to natural science? And first, if we uh, want to approach to Hegel's philosophy of nature, we have to, um, to take account of, uh, of the matter of fact that in Hegel's view, there is no competition between philosophy of nature and natural science, but that they are in, to a certain extent complementary. That is, they complement each, each other, but uh, they are not the same thing. They exclude each other as well. 
that there is a competition is an old misunderstanding of Hegel's account of nature, which I would like to I would like to contribute further contribute to eliminating this old misunderstanding. How is it possible to conceive of nature in the second sense? Nature is our environment, nature is the physical basis of life. Then there's our own nature in, in, in both uh, meanings, <laughs> our physical nature and, and our, well, the essence of human beings, to be a rational being, um, as uh, Aristoteles put it. And then there is the question of, um, uh, of uh, how does nature, nature in the sense of um, physical nature, relate to the human mind and to what Hegel calls spirit, geist, in a very uh, all embracing sense. And we have to realize that we belong to nature, uh, to physical nature, but we do not reduce to nature because uh, the human mind is in a certain extent alien to nature, even though it emerges from our brains. Uh, and the main one of the main uh, distinctions between uh, natural science and science and philosophy of nature is that natural science aims at reduction. Natural science wants to reduce everything in the physical world, including uh, the human mind and uh, and brain, to uh, to the smallest uh, particles of matter, of living matter, of of um, cells and uh, neurons uh, and so on. Um, uh, and and uh, in chemistry and physics, um, uh, um, natural science want to reduce everything to, to uh, in the last analysis, to molecules and uh, particles, atoms, particles, and subatomic articles. But philosophy of nature does not aim at reduction. reduction. At least uh, philosophy of nature is Hegel understood it, and this is quite important. So let me uh, give a, a few comments about the historical background of Hegel's philosophy of nature. Uh, as you all know, when you read Hegel's um, the lectures on the history of philosophy and, and also his works, Hegel uh, takes from all of philosophy of all the times. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, regarding ancient philosophy of nature, an uh, important background is atomism, which uh, aims at reduction and which is the forerunner of modern physics. On the other hand, there is Plato's, uh, Plato's uh, Timaeus. According to Plato, nature is an incomplete image of the idea. And what is closest to the idea, which is uh, the true reality behind everything uh, uh, in nature, are mathematical structures. The Timaeus uh, uh, contains a speculative theory of the cre creation of the world. And according to Plato, the cosmos has spherical form and matter reduces to geometry. So important uh, mathematical structures are absolutely important for Plato. Um, and uh, Plato reduces matter to geometrical forms, to triangles, different types of triangles in the last analysis, which build up the, the platonic um, uh, bodies. Geometrical bodies. Okay. On the other hand, there is Aristotle, the physics of Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle's method is a conceptual analysis of the phenomena. And uh, due to Aristotle is uh, the traditional distinction of nature as physics uh, as opposed to techniques, techne. Nature is for Aristotle uh, the inner principle of change and or rest. And um, his doctrine of change um, is closely related to his doctrine of, of the four causes. But in the last analysis, here is a theological account of nature and the other three, three causes, um, effective uh, um, uh, cause and, and uh, formal cause and material cause. Uh, all these three kinds of causes are subordinated to his teleological account of nature, the, the cause in the sense of purposes. 
for, for Aristotle, uh, nature or the cosmos is a well-organized well system which is centered on human beings and their needs. In modern philosophy of nature, we have to be aware that Newton, the founder of modern physics, wrote the Principia and the Optics. For Newton, natural philosophy was identical with physics. Newton uh, stands in Plato's tradition as far as he um, uh, attempts to model the mathematical structure of the world in his theory of gravitation above all. And his approach to nature is anti-Aristotelian. He thinks, uh, this is in the query part of the optics, that matter and light com consist of atoms. On the other hand, uh, there was uh, Newton's um, big opponent, Leibniz, um, who uh, wrote uh, monodology and, and uh, many short writings, many other short writings, letters and so on. But the central work, one of the central work is the monodology. According to Leibniz, physics is a very good science which, however, deals with abstractions of the real substances which exist in the world, which are the monads for, for Leibniz. Leibniz is also, uh, uh, in, in opposition to Newton, Leibniz uh, stands in Plato's tradition for him uh, as well as for Plato, nature is nothing but an incomplete image of the idea of the real world. On the other hand, he also picks up from Aristotle's tradition um, the, the view that uh, the world has, an, uh, has a teleological structure. Okay, then there came Spinoza with his ethics. Uh, nature is, a unified subs is the unified substance of world and God. God. The, natura, the union of natura naturans and natura naturata. He has a monism of matter on the one hand and mind and spirit on the other hand. There are uh, different affections or modes of one and the same substance. Then there come, came Kant with his metaphysical foundation of natural science, which aimed at the foundation of uh, Newton's physics. As in Hegel's, Hegel's view, this was quite a uh, quite a meager understanding of metaphysics. But on the other hand, there was also the kind of the critique of the power of judgment, according to whom uh, the structure of organisms is irreducible, uh, teleological, and um, uh, who also aims at um, describing and, and grasping in philosophical terms the, uh, the systematic structure of nature as a whole. All this is behind, all these traditions are behind Hegel's philosophy of nature, and he takes up from these traditions, from Plato, that nature is nothing but an incomplete image of the idea. From Aristotle, the method, which he obviously transformed <laughs> quite substantially in his logic, but he also aims, his method also aims at conceptual analysis of the phenomena in the last analysis, even though uh, in a contradistinction to Aristotle, um, Hegel is not in favor of empiricism. This is also obvious. He takes up from Spinoza uh, a dyna the dynamic view of um, uh, the substance, which is identical to the subject for Hegel. He takes up from Leibniz um, the main point that physics um, is nothing but an abstraction of the real uh, structure of nature. From Kant, he takes up the teleological structure of organisms, but he does not accept Kant's, um, uh, Kant's dualism and uh, Kant's uh, splitting of, uh, of the natural world of, of nature in the sense of physics in mechanical structures here and theological structures there. And finally, um, uh, Hegel's philosophy of, of nature has, has also uh, several things in common with Schelling's philosophy of nature. For Schelling, nature um, also was a system of stages. The main distinction between Hegel and Schelling is uh, that Schelling uh, favored um, the idea of biological evolution, which Hegel did not. And uh, also Hegel criticizes uh, Schelling that his account of nature is, uh, is based too much on intuition 
uh, in, rather than concepts. Okay, so let me come to Hegel's concept of nature now. Hegel's logic, uh, I first have uh, to make some remarks on Hegel's logic. Hegel's logic is a unified logic and metaphysics. So if you uh, um, think about the uh, philosophical tradition where uh, logic and metaphysics were apart, for example, in Leibniz system, they are absolutely apart. And also for Kant, they were apart. Uh, for Kant, um, logic deals with the structure of our thinking, with the structure a priori of our thinking, our thought. Uh, but metaphysics deals with the structure of the world. And Hegel's logic attempts to present a unified approach to logic and metaphysics. The concepts are metaphysical concepts and, and um, the logic um, uh, consists in investigating the relations between the metaphysical concepts. The subject of Hegel's logic is the idea. What is the idea? Um, at a first glance, it is a relational structure of purely logical concepts. And the goal of uh, developing this rela relational structure for Hegel is uh, to um, achieve an integration of subject and object. The subject uh, is a thinking subject, the, the, um, uh, well, the, the carrier of the idea and the object is, uh, is, um, is what this carrier of the idea is thinking about. Both are unified in Hegel's account of the idea. Um, and exactly in the sense uh, we deal here with a unified approach to logic and metaphysics. It must also be, uh, one must, uh, must also um, be aware that Hegel's logic is an intentional logic. Extensional logic is about uh, classes of objects, but an intentional logic is about the intention of um, concepts, and that is, it is only about the conceptual contents. And um, a crucial idea uh, of Hegel's logic is, uh, of his approach is that uh, the object of a concept is identical with its content, and uh, this content, on the other hand, is identical with its relation to other concepts. And if the logic starts with the words, with the, with the phrase, the famous phrase, uh, sein und nichts ist dasselbe, uh, uh, being and nothing are the same thing, then Hegel immediately, immediately starts to discuss the relation between both concepts and comes to the concept of being. And this is the principle of his dialectics. Uh, his dialectics, is, his method uh, consists in um, uh, the evolution of conceptual relations and um, I can only very shortly mention here that the principle of this method is um, something like uh, systematic underdetermination here, here and U is missing in first word, underdetermination. Um, uh, this is uh, a systematic underdetermination of concepts, like in this very general concepts of um, being and nothing at the beginning of the logic, and um, to uh, um, analyze uh, the deviant, uh, deviancies uh, of, of um, this underdetermination and to complete the concepts by unification with their opposite concept. With a, with, a negation, with a negation of the concept. So the end point, point of this uh, evolution of uh, conceptual relations uh, in the logic is the absolute idea. Uh, the, the absolute idea is an absolute totality of concepts. And um, at uh, this end stage of the logic, Hegel claims that um, he has achieved an absolute integration of concepts and their contents, but there is still uh, a deficiency, um, uh, namely that the, uh, the absolute idea still is a logical structure without any external existence. And it is absolutely abstract, even though it is the, the absolute totality of whatever we may think and conceive in our thoughts. So 
Then comes the transition, um, transition from logic to the philosophy of nature. And this is a transition, a transition from, from the pure logical structure, which is the idea for Hegel, to an exist, existing structure to being in the sense of, of the very beginning of the logic, but also in the sense of external existence. So the quest uh, for reality um, is the principle of the transition from the logic to the philosophy of nature. Uh, uh, the philosophy of nature is the first uh, of two parts of Hegel's real philosophy. And the quest for reality in this transition is the quest for external existence. And here I quote Hegel from the end of Hegel's logic, the last paragraphs. The idea, namely in positing itself as the absolute unity of the pure concept and, and its reality, and thus collecting itself in the immediacy of being, is in this form as totality nature. So um, the idea posits itself uh, as absolute unity of uh, a pure concept on the other hand, uh, one hand, and its external reality. Um, uh, on the other hand, and um, uh, collects itself in uh, the immediacy of being, um, uh, being in the sense uh, of being at the begin uh, uh, of the category at the beginning of the lo logic, but being also in the sense of external uh, existence. And I may also remain remind you here that uh, somewhere in the introduction to the encyclopedia, Hegel writes that uh, philosophy is a, is a circle of circle or a sphere uh, of spheres. Uh, and uh, then uh, this uh, quest for reality, this transition to external extent, uh, existence, Hegel describes as the absolute liberation of the idea, this absolute Freilassen der Idee. And he determines it, uh, it as an external totality in space and time. I continue with a quote, the poor idea, pure idea into which the determinedness or reality of the concept is itself raised into concept is rather an absolute liberation. On account of this freedom, the form of its determinedness is just as absolutely free. The external externality of space and time absolutely existing for itself without subjectivity. Um, and uh, I would like to emphasize that this uh, transition uh, from uh, logic to nature, from, um, from uh, the absolute idea to uh, um, the existence of uh, the idea as an external totality in space and time is for Hegel a logical transition. It is not to be understood this is also one of the very old misunderstandings um, of Hegel's philosophy. It's not to be understood in the idea, uh, in the sense that the idea would generate or give birth to nature. This is not the case. It's just, um, um, uh, it is just uh, a product of Hegel's kind of logical, ana logical analysis. So, and then uh, he gives his concept of nature at the beginning of uh, his philosophy of nature. Uh, nature is the idea in the form of otherness, the idea in ihrem Anderssein. The idea um, deliberates itself to external being. Um, uh, the corresponding logical correct category is the category of being. Uh, and this uh, being is realized in the external externality of space and time. And uh, here is my translation of uh, paragraph 247. Nature has resulted as the idea in the form of otherness. In the Petri translation we read, nature has yielded itself. That sounds too much for me as uh, the idea gives birth to nature. Um, we may translate it a little more modest and I suggest to, to say nature has resulted as the idea in the form of otherness, a result of logical analysis. Since in, nature, since in nature the idea is thus the negative of itself or is external to itself, nature is not merely external in relation to this idea and its subjective existence, the spirit, 
the third part of the system of Hegel, but externality constitutes the determination in which it exists as nature. So the idea um, deliberates itself into the negative of itself, uh, the usual process of negation of Hegel's dialectics. And this means for Hegel that the idea in nature is disintegrated into isolated, separate moments. And there is no freedom, there is only contingency and necessity. Uh, this seems, this sounds a bit of paradoxical because uh, at the end of logic, um, he writes that, uh, that the idea deliberates itself in, in the absolute freedom in, in the, into the external, externality of the totality of space and time. But here, um, if, uh, he uh, says uh, that there is no freedom in nature, this is freedom in another sense. Concept of freedom has many facets for Hegel and uh, it is also subject to a conceptual evolution which runs from the idea through nature to spirit. So in uh, paragraph 248 he writes, in this externality of space and time, the determinations of the concept have the appearance of an indifferent subsistence and isolation regarding each other. The concept, der Begriff, therefore exists as internal, nur als ein Inneres. Hence nature exhibits no freedom in its existence, but only necessity and contingency. Zufälligkeit. So uh, again, um, uh, uh, to the question whether um, uh, this account is paradoxical, three remarks. The concept is only internal to nature. So um, in nature, there is no freedom proper. Freedom proper we only find in, in, the, in the philosophy of spirit and in the human mind and in the human institutions and so on. Um, and on the other hand, contingency and necessity uh, are also not only contradictory or opposite concepts, but they are also complementing each other in nature. And necessity here has to be understood as opposed to freedom. And when I prepared the talk and uh, thought again about uh, Hegel's relation to Plato, I asked myself uh, whether this kind of necessi necessity uh, may be understood in a certain sense similar to the concept of blind necessity in the sense of Plato's Timaeus. This might be interesting to investigate the, relation between, the relations between Hegel's uh, philosophy of nature and Plato's uh, Timaeus. I never did. Okay, fourth part of my talk, the logical structure of nature. Nature as the idea in the form of otherness is a system of stages. The concept, der Begriff, in Hegel's sense, is only internal to nature. Um, and this means that the, um, on the one hand, the absolute idea and all is, its different moments and concepts and its totality is still existing in nature as something internal. But on the other hand, the moments of the absolute idea are disintegrated in nature, and that means that they coexist in space uh, and um, with, uh, without many relations, as isolated moments. And the logical evolution of uh, the concept in Hegel's sense is for Hegel um, an evolution within nature that runs from simple structures to structures of more and more increasing complexity. Uh, he writes in uh, paragraph 249, nature is to be regarded as a system of stages in which one stage necessarily arises from the other and is the truth closest to the other from which it results. This closest to the other is uh, uh, some kind of reservation and expresses some kind of distance to truth um, and um, uh, expresses also that uh, we should be unaware that nature contains a contingent form and not everything is necessar necessary in nature. And there are also, um, well, uh, to the concept of necessity of Hegel here, 
um, perhaps I may add also the remark um, that it may be understood in two senses. On the one hand, necessity in the sense of uh, the laws of nature, uh, in the sense of Kant's uh, principle of causality, let us say, or in the sense of Newton's, um, uh, Newton's law of gravi universal gravitation. But on the other hand, necessity is, uh, is, the, is for Hegel the necessity of, um, of uh, the logical structure of his concept and the absolutely uh, absolute idea and its moments and their relations. So this necessity um, uh, about which he talks here, that one stage necessarily arises from the other, concerns the internal existence of the idea within nature. On the other hand, and here comes the uh, uh, distinction of Hegel's account to, to Schelling's account, uh, the system of stages <coughs> at which nature has to be regarded should not be understood in such a way that the one would be naturally produced or generated by the other, but rather in the inner idea, in the sense of the inner idea which constitutes the ground of nature. I think the sense is um, the phrase, the, the sentences, the sentence is also incomplete in a German and um, uh, one should um, add uh, rather in such a way that uh, in, rather in the sense of the inner idea which constitutes the ground of nature. Okay, so the logical uh, evolution of the concept um, focuses on the logical relations between the different structures that of increasing complexity that coexist in nature, but Hegel has no temporal evolution in focus. This does not mean that he um, uh, would preclude such a biological um, or historical evolution of nature. He uh, simply thinks uh, that uh, the historical evolution of nature is not an interesting subject for his philosophy of nature. It is uh, a sub subject of, uh, of natural science, but not of his philosophy. He is only interested in the relations between the logical structures that coexist internally in nature. So the system, um, nature as a system of stages, you all probably will know very, very well uh, the systematic organization of, in which he built up his, his philosophy of nature. I give just a few remarks on it and I mainly um, dealt with the mechanics in my own former work on Hegel. Um, the philosophy of nature um, concerning the contents begins with space, time, motion and matter. Space, time and motion are mathematical concepts for Hegel. Uh, with mo motion, um, uh, the dialectical evolution comes into nature. Uh, nature and uh, matter, uh, with matter, real existence comes into nature or is present in nature, but um, to be said better. So uh, the mechanic parts of his uh, philosophy of nature uh, develops the mathematical and discusses the mathematical foundations of mechanics. Space, uh, the concept of sc space is a concept of abstract, abstract externality. And this corresponds to the logical concept of immediate being uh, from the beginning of the logic. Uh, space is an abstract principle of coexistence. On the other hand, time, the concept of time, uh, he explains it as uh, abs the concept of absolute negativity and it corresponds to um, uh, being for itself and uh, is uh, something like an abstract principle of not nature going into itself. Much can be said about this. I, I just give a few remarks. And then uh, he develops his account of matter and, and um, uh, the principle of mechanics and so on and so on. And he criticizes Newton or better uh, Newtonianism uh, and, um, and uh, the mechanic 
mechanics, the, the last stage of mechanics for him is the most logical stage of mechanics for him is the solar system as an organized structure. And this is the first stage of the idea return, returning into itself in the structure, logical structure of a mechanism, which has a, which has a central body, the sun and everything else is organized around the sun. So motion uh, corresponds to becoming. Uh, uh, Newton's concept of inertial matter for him is an abstraction of real motion. Uh, and here he criticizes the Newtonian account of matter to a certain extent. In, in Newton's Principia, we read uh, that um, uh, inertia uh, is, a, uh, is a primary property of matter, but uh, gravity for Newton in a certain sense is not because it, it's a, a relational um, a property. And on the other hand, Newton's law of uh, gravitation um, explains us that uh, because uh, gravitation is a universal force uh, with infinite, um, uh, um, uh, which, uh, with, um, uh, which um, uh, is active about infinite uh, distances. So there is no uh, real inertial motion no, um, in the world uh, according to Newton's uh, law of gravitation. And this is one of points, uh, of Hegel's points of criticism of, uh, of Newton's account of matter. It is a good account uh, of matter for, uh, for the principles um, of, of, um, of physics, as, uh, of mechanics, as, uh, as a discipline of natural science, but is, it's no good principle for understanding nature as a totality because uh, no, um, there is not a single body in the universe that has an in, uh, inertial um, uh, trajectory ex uh, that uh, pursues exactly um, the force uh, free trajectory of Newton's law of inertia. And uh, we know today uh, that uh, the um, law of inertia might also be uh, conceived in a different sense namely in the sense of Einstein's theory of uh, gravitation, which in Hegel's uh, view probably is closer to truth than, than Newton's theory of gravitation. So um, uh, uh, on the other hand, within um, the development of, of, of the mechanics part, Hegel then comes to a gravitation, uh, which describes uh, true motions of na uh, nature, and uh, he develops an account of absolute mechanics as a true account of matter which um, looks a bit like Aristotelian. <laughs> uh, and this was also um, subject to much criticism of Hegel's uh, philosophy of nature, as you know. Okay, uh, just a very few words about um, the next st um, stages of nature and the system of stages. Physics for Hegel is the sphere of individuality uh, to which belong light, darkness, and the colors. Hegel criticizes mechanistic models of light. Uh, uh, he criticizes um, the wave model of light uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, atomistic or particle model of light. He criticizes both because uh, they, they invent ontology in, in, his, in, in his view, uh, which cannot be found within the phenomena. And it's in his theory of darkness and colors, he has some affinity to Newton's, uh, to, to, to Goethe's theory of colors and, and Goethe's criticism of Newton's theory of colors. But I cannot go into this subject here. Uh, to physics as a sphere of, as the sphere of individuality um, belongs also the specific properties of bodies I, without any systematic um, uh, ambition. I just name uh, the elements, uh, specific uh, gravity, cohesion, sound, and heat. Um, and uh, in addition, there are the physical and chemical properties of nature. Um, uh, he discusses magnetism, electricity, and the chemical processes. And the organic physics, um, uh, the, the last stage of nature, is um, differentiate, different Initiated into geological matter, the life of the earth, so to speak, 
vegetable uh, nature, the uh, world of plants and, and the animals. And the, the highest uh, stage of nature is life, as you all know. Okay. So just to, uh, this was just to mention uh, how this system of uh, stages uh, is structured for Hegel. Uh, and uh, now I'll come back to the beginning of the philosophy of nature. Um, nature, as, uh, uh, which is uh, for him I, uh, the idea as uh, the negative of itself, uh, is obviously a contradictory, uh, a self-contradictory concept. And the con contradiction of idea in nature for him is that um, um, uh, nature um, in its formations, in its structures, uh, unifies necessary elements and contingent structures. So the contradiction of the idea in nature is just this complementarity of necessi necessity and contingency of formations, which I already mentioned. And he writes in paragraph 250, the contradiction of the idea to be external to itself as nature. Here in this sense, uh, the, um, in this sentence, uh, there is a crude error in Petri's translation, a, a misunderstanding of, of, the, um, uh, of the grammatical structure of the German sentence. It should be understood as follows, the contradiction of the idea to be external to is, itself is on the one hand, the contradiction of the necessity of its formation as generated by the concept and the rational determination within the organic, organic totality. On the other hand, this contradiction is, um, um, uh, is a moment of their indifferent contingency and indeterminable irregularity. It is the import, importance of uh, nature to preserve the determinations of the concept only abstractly and to expose the execution of the particular to external determinability. So, nature as the idea in the form of otherness um, is conceived by Hegel as I have just been explaining but we have to ask ourselves in which way do the moments of the idea in Hegel's sense relate to the phenomena of nature? How do the stages of nature and their necessity on the one hand, their contingency on the other hand, relate to Hegel's concepts? Hegel claims that um, the contingent elements uh, of uh, the formations of nature do not correspond uh, to the moments of the idea, but where we have to ask where are the criteria to explain us uh, or to determine what is necessary in nature and what is contingent, um, if not in Hegel's uh, own immanent terms, where are there any external criteria to, uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, to understand the relation between the necessary and the contingent within nature. And the third uh, problem is then um, how do how do Hegel's concept re uh, relate to the results of natural science? So uh, the question of how the moments of Hegel's idea relate to the phenomena of nature has two subproblems. On the one hand, how do the stages of nature relate to Hegel's concepts? And on the other hand, how do Hegel's concepts in turn relate to the results of natural science? It is obvious that Hegel's program is to save the phenomena and um, to not to invent and to criticize additional ontology that is not contained and cannot be observed in the phenomena. Um, and uh, this is a um, certain step back to, to ancient um, uh, physics in the sense of Aristotle. On the other hand, uh, you may also be aware that at the end of the 19th century, Ernst Mach, the empiricist Ernst Mach, also 
claimed that good physics uh, and a good, meta, a good metaphysics of physics should save the phenomena and should not invent additional ontology. So Hegel's program to save the phenomena and not to invent too much of ontology is, um, is uh, directed backwards and forwards uh, towards um, more, uh, uh, more recent accounts of nature as well. Hegel's program is to correct mathematical abstractions. Um, he has a non-reductive account of nature. Um, he does not accept any mechanistic explanations beyond the subjects of mechanics proper. And um, with his criticism of mechanistic models of light uh, and, and also matter, uh, with, with his criticism of uh, um, mechanic attempts and uh, light attempts, um, uh, to a certain extent, he was also right because we know since the foundations um, of quantum mechanics, uh, that um, matter and light do not behave in, in, in their least parts, uh, do not behave like mechanical systems. Uh, so um, this is also a progressive element in Hegel's um, uh, philosophy of nature that he does not ex uh, expect, uh, does not accept mechanistic explanations beyond the realm of mechanics proper, but nobody could know that at his time. That's also obvious. Uh, he uh, takes a certain back uh, step back to to an uh, Aristote Aristotelian account of nature as a system, including the te teleological elements of the Aristotelian uh, account, and he defends a plausible non-reductionist program for his philosophy of nature, but he gives us no clear criteria at all of how to perform this non-reductionist program of uh, uh, comprehending nature. Um, for him, uh, the contradiction of the idea in nature gives rise, uh, gives rise to the logical evolution uh, towards life, uh, this, uh, life as the highest stage of nature and uh, to spirit as uh, uh, element uh, of the real world, which is closest to the idea. And in paragraph 251, we read, nature is implicitly a living whole. More closely considered, the movement through its series of stages is that the idea posits itself as what it is implicitly. Or what is the same, that it passes into itself from its immediacy and externality, which is death, to be first as a living being, but furthermore, also to sublate this determinateness in which it is merely life, and to bring itself forth to the, to the existence of spirit, which is the truth and ultimate purpose of nature and the true actuality of the idea. Um, the term uh, sublate, which I took from um, Di Giovanni's uh, translation of the logic is not found in Petri. Uh, Petri um, uh, writes something like transcend, and this is uh, only one of the many facets of the German term aufheben and sublate is better here, I would say. On the other hand, I was not absolutely <laughs> clear <coughs> what concerns the true actuality of the idea, whether it should be um, translated by actuality or by uh, reality, because we are here dealing with the real philosophy. I leave this open for discussion, this, this problem. It come to the um, last but one part of my talk, Nature and the Human Mind. The philosophy of nature uh, is located in Hegel's system between the logic and the philosophy of the spirit. Uh, the three parts of uh, the Hegel system describe uh, the idea, in a sense, in, in three different elements. Logic is the idea in the element of poor thought. Nature is the idea in the element of externality. And spirit um, is the idea in the element of returning um, to itself. Um, and if we ask how uh, the logic relates to the real philosophy of Hegel, to the philosophy of nature and, and of spirit, then we see the principle of a system is that the idea 
uh, is developed in, in the first part of the system. In the second part, he describes the self-disintegration of the idea in nature. And in the third part, he describes the self-reunification of the idea uh, um, in the philosophy of spirit. Okay, the philosophy of uh, uh, spirit has also three parts, as almost everything in Hegel's work. Uh, subject, uh, um, the human mind belongs to the philosophy of, uh, of subjective spirit. The subject, uh, subjective spirit embraces anthropology, mind and consciousness, and psychology, and so on. The objective uh, spirit embraces the human institutions, law, uh, morals, uh, family, uh, the state and also history, and, and the absolute spirit embraces art, religion, and philosophy. And then um, um, we have to um, uh, take notice of the two first paragraphs of Hegel's uh, philosophy of nature, the ways of considering nature. They describe the approaches of human mind to nature and their systematic place in Hegel's system is obviously the philosophy of the sub subjective spirit. And um, he wants to make uh, his endeavor plausible in these uh, two paragraphs. Uh, he, uh, there he, um, which are new uh, um, as compared to, uh, with the 1870 um, uh, encyclopedia. He describes three approaches um, of human mind to nature, practical, theoretical, and philosophical. Um, uh, practical uh, behavior is the finite and neological standpoint, according to which nature is a resource for the new, for uh, a resource of means for human purposes. It employs natural things as they are in themselves, but um, in the practical behavior, uh, we consume these things and in this way we destroy them by eating, for example. On the other hand, there is a theoretical behavior to nature, the thinking consideration of nature. Nature is, the ob uh, is um, uh, for the thinking consideration, nature is the object of natural science. It aims at objective knowledge of nature, but uh, does not achieve uh, such uh, objective knowledge because it transforms concrete things into abstract forces, laws, and genera. And so we need uh, the philosophical approach, which, which uh, brings uh, um, the other two approaches together, uh, the comprehending consideration of nature um, and uh, the philosophical account of idea as uh, in, uh, of nature as the idea in the form of otherness is for Hegel the true synthesis of theoretical and practical behavior. Um, so I won't read um, this quotation here for the uh, reason of time. Um, uh, the, the point for Hegel is uh, that um, uh, this um, true synthesis of theoretical and practical behavior uh, in his view cures uh, the shortcomings of um, these other two approaches. Um, uh, the comprehending consideration of nature considers nature as it is in itself without destroying um, uh, the, the, the things of nature practically and without um, transforming them theoretically in something else than they are. Uh, and um, uh, here, um, according to Hegel, um, the philosophical ap approach achieves this in such a way that mind recognizes its own conceptual structure within nature. This is the main motive of the relation behind the relation between nature and the human mind and the philosophy of nature and the philosophy of spirit in, in Hegel's um, approach. So let me come to my last remarks. Um, uh, there is this uh, in, in, in the remark of uh, paragraph 246, um, Hegel uh, tells us, and this is the problem, it has already been pointed out that in the course of philosophy, in addition to specifying the objects in its, um, in its conceptual determination, the corresponding empirical appearance has to be denominated and 
it um, uh, has to be shown that the latter indeed corresponds to the former. Concerning the, the necessity of the conceptual content, however, this is no appeal to experience, but an appeal to Hegel's logic, we have to add. Uh, here I also deviate from, uh, from uh, Petri's translation, which uh, has some minor problems here. So, the philosophical approach of the human mind to nature and Hegel's philosophy of nature presupposes the results of natural science, uh, which Hegel considers uh, to be preliminary and historical, whereas philosophy relies on the necessity of his Hegel's concept. And the big question is, the remaining problem is how does this work? Also, after having um, been worked um, uh, now and then and again on Hegel's philosophy of nature for 30 years, I have no answer. Um, philosophy of nature, nature presupposes the results of natural science, but how should philosophy take these results up? Uh, I wrote in, in, a pap in my paper on um, the Hegel's account, Hegel's criticism of mechanistic models of matter uh, and light in the year 1993, I wrote, Hegel was inclined to throw an away any fundamental theories in favor of a purely a phenomenological approach. Even if 20th century concepts of light and matter have finally turned out to be incompatible with mechanistic models, it cannot be said that the ways leading to their formulation were made any easier by Hegel's anti-reductionist view of nature. Even if Hegel's skepticism concerning too much of ontology in physics is an honest trait, his own physics, physics show us that dispensing with bad metaphysics does not necessarily give rise to scientific progress. So now it's clear that uh, the aim of philosophy of nature in Hegel's sense is not to give rise to scientific progress, but on the other way, way around, uh, it, its goal is to, to understand, uh, to, to comprehend nature and philosophical terms uh, as, uh, uh, as um, in a certain accordance with the results of natural science. Uh, but uh, we still have no answer how this complementarity of philosophy of nature and natural science beyond, beyond, beyond Hegel, how this could work. So thank you very much for your attention. And here I listed the, uh, my, my Hegel book and the two papers uh, I wrote in English on Hegel's philosophy of nature. Thank you very much. So I cannot hear you. Uh, now, can you hear Yes, me? yes, now, okay, yes. Thank you very much for this talk, um, Professor Falkenberg. Um, now we can have questions. Um, you can use the raise hand button on Zoom if you'd like to ask a question, or you can have questions on your. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you very much for your talk. Can you hear me well? Um, I cannot understand you very well. Your voice is very low. Could you? <laughs> Could you speak a bit louder? Do you hear me better? Okay. Yes. yes. So, um, I just want to ask you a question about saving the phenomena. And it, this goes back to your final remarks on the relationships between natural sciences, like particular sciences and philosophy. I mean, if saving the phenomena means distinguishing the necessary and contingent aspect of the phenomena. I don't know if you would agree with that. If you would say that we can save the phenomena once we somehow manage to distinguish the necess necessity from contingency, contingency in between them, in within them. If this is right, then aren't particular sciences such as like chemistry, physics, like at the level at which Hegel was relating to them, so the science of his time, aren't them establishing some conceptual distinction, even though they're not aware of that, that then philosophy can reflect upon? Or would you say that the results of particular sciences are merely like historical and like, as you said, for Hegel, they're merely historical? 
Well, I think here one should um, take a step into the philosophy of science in a modern sense. And, and we know that uh, the sciences have changed a lot since Hegel's time. And uh, we know also that there are problems of ref reference and truth with, with uh, scientific concepts uh, in the sense of natural science. But we also know um, that something which is quite stable in, in the course of the history of science is the falsification of theories on the basis of the phenomena. And um, uh, if we want to understand nature, we have to take serious the falsification of mechanistic um, theories, uh, for example, and also the, the uh, we have to uh, take uh, take seriously uh, the more recent insights about the limitations of um, of reduction within the sciences. And I think this is in Hegel's sense, but it is very difficult uh, to to um, take these results from today and and uh, try attempt to to manage some kind of correspondence between he the concepts of Hegel's logic and uh, what science more recently found out in, in view of the um, uh, relations of, uh, uh, in view of the limitations of reductionism. I don't know whether I really answered your question, but it is clear that uh, science uh, brings up again and again interesting concepts. In Hegel's time, it was the concept of polarity, for example, which Hegel also tried to build in um, uh, his account of nature to a certain extent. Um, and Hegel's main point is uh, that we took, to, should uh, take the variety of complex structures in nature seriously without uh, wanting uh, to reduce them to mechanical structures or, or to some kind of final theory. We should uh, take um, the, the, exist the coexistence uh, of, uh, very, uh, of structures of very different uh, com uh, degree of complexity uh, series and um, uh, should try to understand nature in such terms and uh, to interpret uh, this diversity in philosophical terms. I think that's the point. Okay, thank you very much. That was very helpful. Um, we are going to take questions from Zoom. Uh, Federico, if you are ready. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Well, Professor Falkenburg, uh, thank you very much for your great, uh, uh, powerful synthesis of your presentation. My question was about a specific point of your presentation was about the transition from the logic to mm -hmm. uh, the philosophy of nature, because at some point you claim that um, this transition should not be understood as if a logical idea generated or, or gave birth to nature. And I think that I agree with you um, that we should not conflate this the transition argument, the so-called transition argument, with uh, some physical phenomenon of giving giving birth to something, nor with some uh, nor is it a, uh, Hegel's attempt to rehabilitate some argument of the rational theology of the. 18th century or in the light of a, uh, for example, in the light of an argument of the designer or of the maker. Mm -hmm. But Hegel uh, makes clear that the idea is power, is mm -hmm. creative power, is generative. Um, uh, it, it makes it clear uh, in the logic of the concept and uh, also in the encyclopedia. So my question is, my question for, e for you is, uh, why can't we concede and acknowledge and even appreciate that the fact that Hegel may be committed to uh, a speculative uh, metaphysical notion of creativity that is not physicalist or naturalistic, but 
neither falls into the image of the maker, of the designer, nor is reducible to just one more step in the logical analysis of the idea. Hmm? So my question is, is there a way of interpreting the transition that saves the degenerative power or the creativity and the Tätigkeit des Erschaffens of the idea with so the, the, the synthetical moment of the transition without falling into these extremes, just logical analysis or uh, the sudden uh, eruption of a uh, uh, dogmatic theological argument. Thank you. So my interpretation is quite modest. That's obvious. Uh, and I um, simply argue against the, the, the idea that um, what is happening at, uh, at the end of the logic is some kind of big bang of the idea that it explodes into external, into the externality of space and time. Uh, on the other hand, there are also um, uh, more theological and uh, metaphysical interpretations of Hegel's system, for example, of Michael um, Michael Teunissen. I never studied this. Um, and um, uh, uh, he um, um, attempts to, uh, to, to interpret uh, the structure of Hegel's um, system in terms of, of, of the Holy Trinity. Uh, I, I'm quite reserved against that interpretation, I would say, but as I said, I never studied it in detail. On the other hand, there's a very important point in Hegel's um, philosophical system. Uh, also, if we do not subscribe to, a, to a, such a theologi theological or a highly uh, metaphysical interpretation, we should take serious that idealism is, in, in, uh, is a viable alternative to, to um, materialism, which is, uh, which is uh, the uh, leading um, world uh, view of, of, of many philosophers today. And um, I, I've also written a book on, um, on the myth of determinism, it is only in German, uh, 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 which is about the reducibility um, of mind and consciousness uh, to, to the parts of matter and to what is going uh, on in the neurons. And um, whenever people ask me, well, would you then define, uh, uh, would you then defend some kind of dualism? Then I would say, well, there is an alternative, there's another option, and this is uh, idealism. And the main problem of philosophy today is perhaps that, uh, that uh, there is not enough courage to work on the, uh, on the side of the idealistic program uh, in order to integrate uh, the, the scientific knowledge we have today. So um, my own view um, uh, is that we should start with, with an interpretation which is as modest as possible and then uh, try to study the more speculative interpretations and uh, discuss their limitations. But then we should uh, look at what we may learn uh, to Hegel in, in the present philosophical landscape where, where uh, uh, there is uh, this very bad uh, alternative of uh, materialism and uh, scientism here. Um, everything can be explained in terms of natural science is a very unphilosophical stance. And on the other hand, uh, there, uh, any kind of fundamentalism, which is uh, dangerous. And uh, we should uh, look what we may learn from Hegel, from Hegel's system and his approach to, to, um, uh, to the idea and its relation to nature and mind in the present situation. But this is very ambitious. <laughs> Thank you. But very ambitious, but a necessary program which should be pursued, I think. We have another question uh, in the room. Karen, would you like to ask? Yep. 
Hello, thanks for the talk. Um, I was thinking about the problem you raised at the end of your talk. So, um, because you said Hegel still presupposes the results of natural science and these are historical, whereas philosophy relies on the necessity of concepts. And I was wondering if one could maybe, if one could maybe have, or what do you think about an interpretation that would go along the line saying um, that maybe the logic itself is also historical in a way, um, namely in the way that, okay, there also had to be a Spinoza and a Kant um, in order to develop concepts and then, um, and then for Hegel to take them up and to write his um, logic. So there's also a kind of development and Hegel is taking up the categories already used by other philosophers in the same, um, not maybe in the same sense, but in a way in the same sense, he's, as he's taking up the results of natural science or something like this. So then there wouldn't be maybe, maybe the problem wouldn't lie anymore in the difference between historical and necessity of the concept. Maybe the problem would rather be, okay, if the logic is historical in a way in itself, then the problem is maybe how to explain the necessity? Or yeah, I was just wondering what you think about that. I think it was Hegel's uh, own view that philosophy is, is historical. And uh, we today have the problem that systematic philosophy ended with Hegel. There was no, uh, um, uh, there, there were no um, attempts to, uh, to work on the, prop, uh, the, the program of uh, systematic philosophy after him. There came Marx and there came Neo-Kantianism and uh, all these systems, uh, the, the systems of Neo-Kantianism are much more arbitrary than, than Hegel's procedure was. And, and um, uh, by the way, in Neo-Kantianism, uh, they, they also opposed to Hegel and, and wanted to go back to Plato, the Marburg uh, Neo-Kantians, Cohen and uh, Nartop. Uh, and in their case, uh, it's also not clear how the relation between their kind of logic, uh, the, the logic of pure existence in, in Cohen's terms, on the one hand, <laughs> the results um, of empirical science, uh, on the other hand, uh, he had the same problem. Uh, this was also the historical sta stage of philosophy, which uh, was forgotten by historical reasons uh, uh, due to the emigration of Neo-Kantians after, after, um, uh, 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 after 1933. And then there was no discussion between logical empiricists and, and Neo-Kantians. And, and in Germany, Heidegger had remained. And, and all this was very disastrous for the further development of philosophy, in my view. And, and now we, we see many, many disciplines, many highly speci specialized dis discussions also within philosophy and um, may ask ourselves where is uh, the synthetic uh, endeavor of philosophy, where did it remain, <laughs> where, where is it left? Mm -hmm. okay, thanks. Okay, we are going to have a question from Duke. Uh, Uh, hi there, but I couldn't hear. Is that um, my go, is it? You get here. Uh, just this is Stephen Hulgate here. So hello, Brigitte. Hello. It's been a long hello, time. Stephen. Nice to yes. see you again. Very long time, yes. Very long time, yeah, 1990 something. I looked, I looked also again. in the book for preparing this book, um, this talk. I also looked in the book which you edited, which uh, contains yes. one of my papers, yes. Good, and I'm very grateful for you uh, contributing to that. So thank you again. Um, um, right, thank you very much for the talk. That was very, very helpful. Um, I wanted to make a suggestion um, in response to your last point about how the empirical and the, uh, the conceptually necessary might work together. And then I wanted to ask you a broader, more wide ranging question basically asking you to speculate a little bit. <laughs> so the suggestion is, uh, is the following, that um, Hegel claims or writes rather in paragraph 246, as you pointed out, that um, philosophy um, has empirical physics as its presupposition and condition. But first of all, he says empirical physics, I think that's quite important. 
And secondly, I don't think he means that all of science, including necessarily science that comes after Hegel, is the presupposition of that. So let's just focus on those uh, scientific theories that Hegel devotes very specific and detailed attention to. It seems to me, uh, and both are in the section on mechanics, the first is Galileo's law of fall, and the second would be Kepler's laws of planetary motion, particularly the third one. Um, and what's interesting there, I mean, I'm not, obviously you know it better than I do, um, but what I find interesting is that, first of all, Hegel thinks those laws need to be discovered empirically. Um, he makes There's no, no what? I did not, I did not. He, uh, Hegel does not dispute that those laws oh. have to be discovered empirically. Mm. However, what I think he then tries to do is show how they conform to the requirements of the concept. And the bit that I think is very interesting um, is the fact that at the end of paragraph uh, two, four, 267, the very end of paragraph 267, he says the, um, that the relation of powers, that's potence and fairness, mm -hmm. is essentially a qualitative relation and is alone the relation that belongs to the concept. And this harks back to the logic of measure uh, mm -hmm. in Das Realisierte a Mass, where Hegel actually tries to derive very briefly Galileo's fault. So, Laura Fall. So, there seems to be an example where he takes a, an empirical law, uh, but then argues that it conforms to the demands of the concept in that it brings together a simple quantum, namely the, the unit of, of space, and a power namely um, the square of the time. Now we can dispute how successful that is. That's not my point here. I just wanted to suggest that that would give you an example perhaps of what he means. Um, and I think something similar happens in the third law of planetary motion, where he's gonna try and argue that there is something about space and time that requires uh, the, uh, you know, the, the um, mean distance from the sun to be cubed and the orbital period to be squared. He thinks these are not arbitrary. So my basic question, I suppose, was do you think that does, those do provide uh, examples? Um, and do they go some way to answering your question? Um, the other question I have, which is very wide ranging, where I would like you to speculate uh, is the following. Um, do you think there are metaphysical presuppositions in contemporary physics that Hegel would criticize? And if so, what difference, if any, would his critique make? Okay, thank you for these very okay. <laughs> intriguing <laughs> questions. The first question about the qualitative relation. Uh, I always had problems with, uh, with this paragraph and, and uh, what I see is that um, qualitative relations are very important for his endeavor, but what he, what he is after is um, uh, laws uh, that give rise to some kind of self-organization self in nature. That's what, uh, what he's interested in. Yeah. 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 Well, they express, they express that self-determination. They are... They are expressions of nature's autonomy, autonomy. Laws. Of nature's uh, capacity, uh, capacity of uh, organizing it, itself, yes. yes yeah, yes. that's right. Yeah. And this, um, perhaps this uh, capacity uh, of nature uh, to, to self-organize, to organize itself, uh, perhaps he did not uh, focus um, this capacity uh, sufficiently because uh, this is obviously a dynamic effect within nature that goes into the direction of, um, of some kind of physical evolution of nature, and not just logical evolution of, uh, of um, more and more um, complex stru structures that are coexisting. Perhaps it, um, uh, one uh, may uh, develop Hegel's uh, thought a little further in this direction. Right, but might one not say that it was never Hegel's ambition to explain everything in nature? That's not Hegel's goal. His goal is to try and show the necessity 
of certain laws of nature and of certain structures and stages in nature and show that they correspond to the concept. But he does say explicitly in the philosophy of nature that, that philosophy is limited with respect to nature. Yes. He ne yes, never yes. says it anywhere else, but so, yes. so the, the ambition to explain all of nature, all of science, I, I don't think was ever Hegel's. But he thinks he can explain, whether he's right or not is another matter, he thinks he can explain certain laws like those of Galileo and Kepler. I uh, do not want to claim that one uh, should uh, look how to explain all of nature with Hegel's concepts, but um, that perhaps um, uh, it was a neglected uh, point in Hegel's uh, philosophy of nature that it may be useful uh, to find dynamical concepts in nature right. yeah. that, uh, that, um, that um, uh, uh, foster something like um, physical evolution. And he refused that because mm -hmm. he was so much in opposition to, to, to Schelling. Yep. So perhaps this was a bit one-sided. Uh, yeah. He may, he may, uh, so my point is just, he might make more out of his own concept of time <laughs> within his philosophy of nature. Uh, so, so far, uh, my answer to your first question and your second question, well, uh, um, Hegel would criticize uh, uh, the attempts uh, to, to, um, uh, to, uh, look still for a unified um, uh, theory of physics after more than a uh, hundred years of, of quantum theory and uh, all um, failed attempts to unify gravitation here and a quantum theory there. Um, and um, he would say this is a fruitless, he probably would say this is a fruitless research program and doesn't help us to have a to get a philosophical understanding of nature. He, he would be uh, quite on the line of, uh, uh, of, of Niels Bohr, I would say. <laughs> and uh, the, the, uh, to, to look for uh, many levels of different kinds of complementarity in, within nature, starting with physics. And on the other hand, he would say, well, there's a lot of bad metaphysics in, um, uh, in the philosophy of physics. Uh, when, when there are still so many people who want um, uh, to, uh, um, to restore quantum determinism. Uh, one might argue against these people with Hegel very, very well. And by the way, they never convinced me, these attempts to, to draw back to 17th uh, century determinism when physics, when 20th physics, uh, century physics um, taught us uh, that, that um, matter is uh, so much more <laughs> interesting in its basic structures <laughs> than Laplace would have imagined. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. That was it. Was very good to see you again, and um, and uh, thank, thank you. you very much for your talk and your answers. Annette, I see you are on the screen as well, and I would like uh, yes. to say Hi. hello to you as well. Uh, <laughs> can I speak now? Yeah. yeah. It's a little bit okay. Bit. So hello, Brigitte. Um, I'm Annette from Bochum, and it's so yes, nice. I know. <laughs> yes. We met a long um, time ago. Yes. Really, and um, yeah, thank you for your great um, talk. I'm, I'm very inspired now and I've got um, a question concerning your interpretation of the logic. You say um, the pure logic, pure concepts, but the idea includes subject and um, object and the idea has got contents and these contents are taken from external, from the external world, from nature. And I think the idea needs these contents for its um, constitution, otherwise it would be um, empty. So the external contents, are yes, they are mediated, also vermittled in the logical process, but the concepts relate to, in the logic to, to, to nature and especially to the, um, to the living nature. 
So I'm really interested in your interpretation of these concepts of mechanism, chemism, and life. Are they only um, illustrations for logical movements or are they metaphors? Oh, um, yes, that's what I would like to, to ask you because you said pure um, logic. And I think the logic isn't, um, yes, for, in, in my opinion, the logic isn't um, pure. So the logic is pure. Uh, Hegel claims that it is pure in the sense of, uh, of um, containing only uh, concepts a priori and in, um, uh, in, uh, uh, and also regarding Hegel's claim that we should not draw on intuition uh, nor on uh, empirical structures in order to to um, to um, give foundations to, to a philosophical system. Um, but I, uh, I never have, uh, have been working on, on the parts of a mechanism uh, and, and uh, teleology of, of, uh, and life of uh, logic. Um, so it is obvious uh, that, um, that uh, he somehow takes these structures uh, from our way of thinking about the external way. Uh, uh, from our way of thinking about the external world, but his claim is not to take them directly from the external world, world uh, perhaps something like that. And he tries to raise them uh, at the uh, level of pure logic in order to, to analyze the relational structure which they express. That's my view. But how the idea of mechanism comes uh, from the real world into um, our thinking and from our thinking in, into the system of the logic, I have no idea. Okay, thank you. Now I know your interpretation. It was good. <laughs> yes. Okay, um, we have two more questions from the room. Um, Hello, this is Philip. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, but I, uh, somehow I don't manage to see you. I... No, you, you can't because we're in the hall. Uh, the camera is only directed against uh, Mert, so sorry about that. But you can hear me all right. Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, th thank you for your talk. Um, I have uh, a question about the passage that is on screen right now. Um, so I was wondering um, what you think of being in that sentence, whether that refers to the uh, pure being at the beginning of the logic, or whether it means something, you know, immediate being more loosely. But, um, and depending on what you answered there, I'm, what I'm really wondering about is what's the significance of totality? Then? Because what is what? I don't get it. What is the significance of totality? Ah. Right, because if we are talking about the immediacy of pure being, there is no totality in pure being. But now we, we are, you know, coming to the end of the logic, there is totality. Mm -hmm concept so on are we then going back to the pure being with totality is that what's going on or do you see something else going on there well at the end of logic we in the at end of the logic we have the absolute um, totality uh, of the idea and this absolute totality of the idea deliber deliberates it to itself uh, into nature and this, um, uh, this means that it is this totality of the idea that deliberates itself into the immediacy of being within nature. Is that a clear answer? No? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to have to think about it. Uh, yeah. When, when, when um, the, at the end of the logic, we have the absolute idea in its complete totality, in its, its completeness and absolute totality. And uh, it contains many, many, many moments. Um, it contains all the moments of all the uh, categories that the logic went through, from the logic of a being through the logic of um, uh, big, um, uh, Wesens uh, logic, logic of essence, to uh, the logic of the concept, uh, the, the, the absolute idea at the end of logic 
of the logic contains all these moments. And what happens um, in a metaphorical sense of happening, what goes on for Hegel is that um, now we have to be aware that um, if we want to talk about reality, we have to talk about all these moments of the idea uh, as reality, really existing and as uh, ex uh, being external to each other, as coexisting. And if we want to uh, grasp, grasp this uh, again in philosophical terms, as we did in the logic, we have to start again from the most abstract level. And this is the, the, the category of uh, of, imme uh, of immediate being, and this is abstract space. So um, uh, Hegel does not start at the beginning of his philosophy of nature with life. He starts from the most abstract and, and meager concept, and this is a concept of space. But uh, the concept of space is for Hegel uh, simply abstract account of everything that is coexisting in nature from the planets to life. Is it a little bit clearer now? Yeah, that's that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, and do we have time? Yeah, we have. Fantastic. Yes. I've got a number of questions. I will wait for Mert to give me an annoyed look if I go on too long. Uh, my first observation is that when we're discussing sections of the science of logic leading up to the movement into nature, you quote from the greater logic, and you make reference to, for example, the circle of circles, that idea of the completed circle of logic, and then the leap onto another ring of the system. Uh, that definitely feels like a greater logic image. But then, because there is no counterpart to the greater logic in nature, when we start looking at the definition and nature of nature, uh, we have to, you have to quote from the encyclopedia version, and I can see that to try and match the dates, he used the 1817 version to try and stop them being distant. I, uh, I did not catch the last point. Could you repeat it uh, and speak a uh, bit? The microphone uh, has been brought to me. The microphone has been brought to me. Um, Thank you. Um, I noticed that you very helpfully quoted from the 1817 encyclopedia to try and get the dates to work, uh, which was very helpful. But this does create uh, the possibility that Hegel had one idea for the project of nature in his mind when discussing it in the greater logic, and then another project in mind for the encyclopedia version. Um, to flesh that out, the greater logic version would be a free jumping off into nature, and then a sort of accumulation of natural, scientific, or empirical, physical, findings which were curated and ordered in the way he did because he felt he had a sort of inner faculty of discernment to peer behind the sensuous veil and try and make guesses about what's going on under the hood. In the encyclopedia version the tone seems to be more of a straightforward derivational structure and a good textual example would be the derivation from point to line to plane in the development of space. Uh, in that second interpretation, empirical physics would be relegated to one, a historical prerequisite for the project, in much the same way that ancient Romans couldn't have written science of logic, and two, a matter of convenience in naming. Uh, do you think there's any hazard of something like that going on? Hegel writing two projects and then us trying to collate them together after the fact? No, I don't think so, because uh, when I... Uh, um whenever I read in the logic part of the encyclopedia, I just uh, thought that this is an abridged version of the big logic uh, for, for the purposes uh, of his lectures, but I did not see any, any substantial differences between what he says here and what he says there. And um, no, I don't think so. <laughs> We can go all the time. We go all the time. If you have lots of questions, that should work. Hmm. Because this is a lot of session. So. Hmm. If, if, I, if I understood correctly your question. No, no, you, you've, you, you've understood, and a clear no is a clear no. Um, I had that suspicion when I was reading it, but I could well be going awry. I have one other item for you, 
which is that uh, you've framed Hegel, presented him against reductionist uh, approaches to natural science, the approach that tries to decompile natural scientific phenomena down to uh, the lowest constituents available in that field. Um, I'm not sure, as a point of anthropology of current scientists, whether there are many current scientists who currently think that, as in uh, laboratory working scientists. I also doubt that working philosophers of the special sciences think that, especially philosophers of physics. Uh, in my engagements with them, they seem to think that we choose mathematical apparatus, apparatuses for their predictive power, convenience, mathematical elegance, um, stand, how many other theories rely on them, and then philosophers of physics create imaginary universes that would, that would obtain were the given mathematical apparatus true of them. Uh, they do a wholly unrelated, almost like a uh, fiction creating project. Uh, I haven't met a reductionist in a long time. Merely an observation. So, what is the question now? I, I suppose not so much a question as I don't know whether that specific framing, the framing of Hegel as an anti reductionist project, uh, is hit, it, say, striking at a target that's represented in modern philosophy of this particular sciences. Reductionism is a philosophical attitude. This is uh, obvious. And, and um, there are many physicists who don't subscribe um, as a reductionist uh, program and um, uh, working in other fields of physics and, and think that, um, uh, for example, in condensed metaphysics, and, and they don't think that everything reduces to the behavior of subatomic particles. And um, there was also Ernst Mach already uh, um, more than 100 years ago, but several de decades after Hegel, who argued in favor of a phenomenological physics. And, and so um, it is true that not all physicists are reductionists, only, only phys physicists are working in the field of um, elementary particle physics used to be, and uh, physicists working in the, in the unification programs also used to be. But uh, there are many others that are aware of the limitations. And um, it is true uh, that philosophers uh, uh, tend to pick up uh, these uh, big theories and make up uh, possible worlds out of them uh, instead of focusing uh, on the many interesting uh, details of nature that are studied in so many other subdisciplines of physics and uh, other specific sciences beyond, much beyond physics. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Professor Falkenberg, and let's uh, give a, a round of applause. This was the last session of today, but tomorrow uh, we will continue from uh, 9 a.m. in the morning, uh, UK time. And please uh, don't hesitate to join us on Zoom, um, and let's, let's call the day. Thank you very much for participating online and, and for those who are in the room with us. So Thanks thank again. you again. Thank you again for inviting me and thank you again for this very interesting discussion.